Good evening, everyone. We are now in Zechariah chapter 5. A little bit of background that we need to be aware of how the Jewish commentators, uh, when they are looking at a book like Zechariah as a very late prophetic book, that the visions and the understanding of prophecy uh, in the Jewish minds uh, is deemed that they have degraded. Okay, so let me just put this down. The degrading of understanding. And the reason why they say it is that before the exile, before the, uh, the, the when God punished them, uh, we have the final major prophets. Uh, and they will come in the form of Jeremiah, and then in the form of Ezekiel, and then Daniel. Now, Subsequent to that is where we have the final three prophets, uh, the book of Haggai, and then Zechariah and Malachi. And in these three uh, prophetic books, you find that many of the prophecies are not in such great detail. And the Jewish commentators will are finding it difficult to actually understand. And so one of the points that I would like to make at this time is that while we are unable to say for certain what some of these things may mean, uh, we can actually derive what we call how the Jewish commentators may speculate. And so they do not emphasize this as a particular view, but as one of the various views that some of the more learned men of all may have an opinion. And so these are what we call opinions rather than definiteness. For example, when we were in the book of Daniel, we can see definiteness because the details are clear. When we are now in the book of Zechariah, and Zechariah contains a lot, a lot of visions, and they are not particularly clear in many cases, and so they call this the degrading of understanding. So I'll just leave that in your mind so that when we go through the book of Zechariah, you will see that many things are difficult to appreciate and understand, even in the Hebrew. It begins with this, then or and then. Whenever we see this kind of words, you see that this follows chapter 4. Now, how long after chapter 4, we don't know. But we know that this is a new vision. And so, I, Zechariah, raised my eyes again. Meaning he had raised it and he had lowered it and he raised it again and looked. He raised it and then he looked. And then he, behold, a flying scroll. Now understand that when you have in your English Bibles, these words in the italics are not there. They are supplied for reading or readability purposes. So that it will flow in an English sense. Now there was a flying scroll. Uh, and you notice this word scroll comes from the word um, Megillah. And the word flying is giving us a picture that it is hovering. So flying really means hovering. It also means uh, to, I guess, to fly. It has that kind of a word. And so think of it, it's not like a flying rocket or anything like that, but it's a picture that it is in the air. I think that would be a, a good way of looking at it, in the air. 
Now, we don't know where the motion and direction is because the text doesn't say. But it is a flying magilla. So a scroll is an English word. And this is not your graduation scroll. This is a scroll of ancient times. And it is probably, if you want to see it this way, maybe I'll draw it the other way. Like this. And it is called a flying scroll because it's in the air. I think that would be a way of looking at it. It's in the, well, I guess in a cloud somewhere. Uh, but perhaps this is an imagery of sorts that you need to be aware of. It's a magila, a scroll that has writing on it. Do not assume that a Megillah is about the Bible. A Megillah is merely describing the nature of what is seen, which is literally a scroll, something that's rolled up. And then he said to me, what do you see? See, always that you find the angel always say, says to Zechariah, what do you see? It's always about seeing, right? It's always about seeing the perception. And why it keeps asking, it's because, well, the Jewish commentators think that the angel is not sure whether Zechariah is seeing the right thing or not. And so I said, I see a flying magilla. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. So we find this is 20 cubits. And this is 10 cubits. Now, interestingly, I think we could convert this to inches. And this could be, well, I guess, um, 50 feet, 20 cubits uh, in a 15 inch by cubit would be about 300 inches or divided by 12, it is 25 feet. And so 10 would be 150 inches or 12 and a half feet. So that would be an estimation from our standpoint, that you can see it is not a tiny little graduation scroll. It's a huge scroll. In fact, this would be the dimension of the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. This is the same dimension, 20 cubits by 10 cubits. And so there is something very specific about the dimension. And then he said to me, so you notice that this is flowing one after another, like a little conversation, at least in this case. This is the curse. Now, the idea of curse, this word here, gives us... Um, well, I guess you could say it is not quite the same as how we have other words for curse. This word for curse is about a swearing, something you swear, but it's in the negative sense. It is a swearing or an oath in a negative sense. So it's written down and it is a curse. And that is going forth over the face of the entire land. And this very much gives a, a picture of something like in Ezekiel chapter 2. Now, Ezekiel chapter 2, uh, like in verse 10, Ezekiel sees an, a scroll as well. Not a flying scroll, but a scroll. And it has curses written on it on both sides of the paper, inside and outside. Now, this is a huge scroll, so a lot of curses or imprecation, 
things that you say that is negative, that is bad, that sounds like a curse. So understand this. Curses doesn't come in the form of, um, of, of, I don't know, bad omens, right? That, that's not a curse. When you say bad things of others, that is considered a curse. You are making an oath that you wish the other person was suffering in a certain way. That is this idea of curse. And it is imposed on everyone who steals and they will be perched away according to the writing on one side. And everyone who swears, and this in this case, uh, this idea of swearing is to swear falsely, uh, to swear with no intent. So we can say, Mal intent, uh, and they will also be purged according to the writing on the other side. So we have one side, and so you have the other side. So we need to now understand that the writing is both on the outside and on the inside as well. So inside and outside. And in the scroll, Zechariah is told by the, uh, the angel who is describing. So you, since you can't see, I'm going to tell you what's on it. And these are curses. And the curses is going on two categories of people. Everyone who steals. Now, the idea of stealing. Steal, uh, and this what this word says. Uh, everyone, uh, you would hear. Well, this word doesn't really mean everyone, right? This word actually means um, the house, the house who steals, and in this way, this is ganav. Steal literally means um, to, to take what is protected. That is the idea of steal in this case. And uh, quite interestingly, there are many words. And so the one who take what is protected is a Thief. And so in this case, we have this word uh, as a thief. In the house of thieves, they will definitely be purged. Now, the other sin, I guess, the other curse is on the other side. It's to the the house, right? The house of the one who makes false oath. And this one is false oath. And let me just explain this. Uh, false oath. And we see this in verse 4, right? In verse 4, what it means by false oath. So two houses will be perched, removed. And one is the thief and one is the false oath. Both are considered very severe and very uh, extreme in the eyes of God. And God has to place a curse on them. Now that's the vision that, Zechariah is seeing. Now in verse 4, it says this, I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts. And so Zechariah is hearing what the angel is saying. And God 
is saying that I will make it go forth. What is it? The Megala. The scroll. The scroll of curses. It will enter into the house of the thief and the house of one who swears falsely by my name. So you find that this is making a false oath in God's name. Now, the way that they make oaths in the past is that they would say, no, as long as Jehovah lives, seven times. And it is a very strict oath because it has to be done. Otherwise, God will deal with that person because that is a false oath. And so God says, yeah, I'm here to deal with this because you are making all that is false and you are using my name. False means to uh, shaker, that is to lie about it. You are making an oath that you really don't mean. You are making a pretentious oath and you're using my name in vain. And that is a serious offense because when you touch God's name, you are misrepresenting God. And so God is very severe, not only with people who steal things or, and, and take things where it's protected. It's particular about one who makes an oath and swears by God's name, making God uh, a liar in that sense, making God untrue. And God will deal with such people. And it will spend the night in that house and destroy it with its timber and stones. Now, this is a vision, understand this. And this idea of destroy means cease to exist. And you would find that it is also an, an incredible uh, demonstration that wood and Stones can be destroyed. And this is, uh, I guess you can say that this is an extremely uh, important vision to remind Zechariah how God is viewing such severe cases. Right? Such severe cases. Now, this is the vision of the flying scroll. In verse 5, And then the angel who was speaking with me went out and said to me, Now you raise your eyes and then you see what is this that is going forth. Now the idea of going forth is going out. Going out. And so we have number one, the flying Magilla that came out. Number two, we have this next thing called the Effa. An Effa, which is a weighing. A weighing volume, right? A, a weighing uh, instrument. And so he says, oh. And then I said, what is it? Then he said, this is the effa going forth. So what do you mean by going out? Now, the, we are not told exactly where is it going out from, right? This is going out. And it's going out to the land. So it has to go out from somewhere to the land. So we have the flying scroll zooming out. And now we have an FR. The FR is going out and FR is a dry measure. Dry measure tool. And says so this is their appearance in all the land. This is what you see, right? The appearance is what is seen. 
in all the land. Now, according to the commentators, they say that this is very much coming out of the temple. These are curses, judgments of God going across the land. And in verse 7, he says, And look, a lead cover was lifted up. Um, this is a lead cover. It means this, an ephah is a container. It has a specific volume. And I think the, the volume is generally about uh, 40 liters. 40 liters. Big one. A big one. But what we are now told is that there is a lead cover. The lead cover was lifted up, so we have a lead cover. It was lifted up. And what was seen is that there was this woman sitting inside the Esfa. And so we would say that there is a woman in the Esfa. And she is being weighed. So this is a specific volume of 40 liters. So when you actually want to know, uh, I, I want one effa of wheat, for example, then they would fill this up and that would be equivalent to 40 liters of, of wheat. And so this is something that is being seen. So it has a vision that represents certain things. Then he said, so this, and then, he says, this is wickedness. Now, what is wickedness? This is, well, they call it Risha, from the word Rasha, right? This is Risha, from the word Rasha, this is guilt. This is the wrong that is done by walking away. And he thrust her into the middle of the ephah and threw the lead weight on its opening. So what happened is you find that the angel is now showing an action the woman is now pushed back into the effa. And now we have this cover. And this cover is now covering the effa. And so the woman is now inside. And so we have wickedness inside. And now, the idea of wickedness as a woman is also seen this way. The word wicked is risha. And this is a feminine word. And thereby it, it represents a woman. So in its imagery. When we were doing the book of Proverbs, we would also see the word wisdom. And wisdom in the Hebrew is chokmah. And it is also a feminine word. And hence, a woman is used to represent wisdom. So in this case, wickedness or risha is a feminine word. And so this is like a woman, is represented by a woman. Verse 9, and then... I raised my eyes and looked. And there, two women were coming out with the wing, wind in their wings. And they had wings like the wings of the stork. Now, the idea of the wings of the stork or the heron 
this will be uh, well not like the pigeon, right? And they lifted the ephah between the earth and the heaven. So the picture would be like this. For some reason, Zechariah can't tell. Now there are two women, and in the, I guess they are saying that in a degraded vision of prophecy, they see two female looking persons. And they came with wings like stalks. And they were picking up. So we have to see this. They were picking up the effa. This is the effa. This is a big container of 40 liters. And they brought it up in between heavens and the earth. Now, what does that mean? It means that it is above the land. But here is the skies. The word heavens is skies. The word earth is land. And so they are in suspension in between above the land. So it's, a, it's at least we know that it's above. And that is the vision. Now, perhaps Zechariah saw the imagery a little wrong because angels are all seen as masculine. So angels are always masculine reference and never feminine. And so some of the uh, Jewish commentators are saying that, well, you can see the degradation of Zechariah's vision. Uh, he is not seeing things very clearly and it's difficult to understand what all these things actually mean. In Zechariah chapter 5, verse 10, we now have the end of this vision. And then, after seeing this vision, I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the ephah? Are they going somewhere? And then, he said to me, to build And this is not a temple, by the way. The word here is a house. To build a house uh, for her. And this idea here, her would be the wickedness in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. And so these are difficult words to actually understand. The word, the land of Shinar, uh, by definition, is Babylon. And to build a house for her, that would be wickedness. And this gives us a picture to build a house in and, and have it established. When it is prepared, means it is firm. That's the idea here. It's stable. She will set there on her own pedestal. Now, the word pedestal literally means a fixed base. If you like, uh, as a, a, a fixed spot. So that is what pedestal means. It means that it is in a fixed position, in a fixed location, but it is in Shinar. It is in Babylon. And this has nothing to do with the temple. And so it is a house that is saying that in 
some comments would be that these Jews are always looking at themselves. They are saying that God is very upset with them and that is why, because of their guilt, they are taken to Babylon and they are there. Whatever they have done has caused them to be brought there to Babylon. And for many people, they are staying put in Babylon because they think that that is where they will end up. So after 70 years in this time of rebuilding the temple, you can see in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, very few people decided to return back to Jerusalem. Very few people wanted to rebuild the temple. Why? Because for 70 years in Babylon, because of their sins, of their wickedness, they have grown to embrace the land as their own. And so this particular vision is telling them that the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, they have been removed and they are all over the place, but they are not coming back. They are sitting there in their own place, not coming home. And that would be a way where some of these Jewish commentators are saying that they are blaming themselves for their wickedness and God has brought them away from their land. And when the 70 years are up, Nobody wants to come home because they are very comfortable in the land of Shinar. Even when Babylon was there, and then came the Medo-Persian, which they think the two women uh, represents Babylon and Medo-Persia. This is very much telling Zechariah some of the problems that is happening. But because we don't have a lot of details to work with, like in the book of Ezekiel, like in the book of Jeremiah, that is why the Jews think that in the closing of the prophecies, things are a little blur in that sense. And hence, this is the end of chapter 5 with things that Zechariah saw, but without enough details to pin down exactly what he saw and what those things meant. But the Jews are always introspective. They are never blaming other people for whatever has happened to them. And so they look at these prophecies as talking about the Northern Kingdom, and the southern kingdom, and what they have done, and why they have been removed from their land, but they are not coming home voluntarily. And with this, we come to the end of chapter 5.